inhale and go, am I ready for this? Yeah? Yeah, okay. And be gentle with your minds, okay? Be kind. But see if you can add to the ear that listens and to the mind that interprets, see if you can add a filter that may it go to every single creature on the planet that needs this wisdom. What if, what if understanding the thing that everyone needs to understand goes through your system right now. It must have an effect, even if you don't feel it right now. So to amplify that karma, the consequences of that action, just imagine um, all the future creatures who don't exist in the future because it's only in the now. Yeah. <laughs> May they receive whatever insight you get. And that just gives you a hopefully a much more amplified way to use whatever's going through our systems. Because whatever's going through your system is not coming from here. You can't. Whatever you hear is part of you. Okay? Even if I say the same thing over and over and over, your, your mind is interpreting it the way your mind is interpreting it. I can't help that part. And you can't either. <laughs> So let's, let's go, okay? There's a ton of info, so I'm going to say, please try really hard not to interrupt. Go to the back of your book and put, well, and go <laughs> and, and just write the questions that are heard in your brain. Remember I said also on the first class of this course, I said there are so many tangents that we're going to want to know about, and those tangents that, implication, that have implications, right? So, for example, the assumption is that there are past and future lives. And if you're not there, you're going to be stuck in that tangent and just leave it, put it on the shelf and say, well, assuming it does, blah, 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 but I can return to that shelf. And like that, there's so many tonight. So enjoy. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's go back to the, to the chanted verse that got us in here. Because the next thing that Subhuti says to, says to Buddha or the Buddha says to Subhuti, is like, I'd like you to tell me something. Yeah, so let's hear where we're at. <laughs> your merit has no merit. All your goodness, not goodness. What do you think, Subhuti? 
Buddha asked, If someone filled a thousand million worlds with the seven treasures and gave them away in charity, would his merit be great? Subhuti replied, Yes, world honored one, it is because the nature of merit is not merit that the Tathagata is able to speak about merit. Then the Buddha said, If someone understands and passes on even four lines of this sutra to another, his merit is even greater than that of the giver of treasure. Why? Subhuti, all of the Buddhas and all of their teachings of supreme enlightenment spring forth from this sutra. But Subhuti, that which are called the Buddhas and the Buddha Dharma are not real Buddhas and Dharmas. <laughs> Not like you think they are. And this is this class here. Subhuti, what do you think? Can the srota apanna, one who has entered the stream, have this thought in his mind? I have obtained the fruit of entering the stream. Subhuti replied, <laughs> so he says, someone who's entered the stream, can they get the fruits of entering the stream, right? Whatever the last thing said. And this is what Subhuti replied. Can someone read it? And we'll read it at the end. This is vital. Okay, to understand, would you like to read? Thanks. And Subhuti Rest respectfully replied, O conqueror, they do not. And why is it so? It is, O conqueror, because it would be impossible for them to enter anything at all. And this is precisely why we can even speak of a stream enterer. They neither enter into things that you can see, nor into words, nor into smells, nor into tastes, nor into things you can touch, nor into objects of the thought. And this again is precisely why we can even speak of them as having entered the stream. And if it happened, O conqueror, that a stream enterer were to think to themselves, I have attained the goal of entering the stream, then they would begin to grasp to some self in it, and they would begin to grasp to a living being and to something that lives and to a person. So you, you already know a bunch of these things, right? If you've been to these classes, you've heard the living being, the person, the life, you know what that means. Someone share what they remember. It's referring to... Sentient beings. Huh? Sentient beings. All the categories. No, the idea of me oh. and mine. Mm -hmm. me, me as a continuum over this life or me as a continuum over lifetimes. There is no redder. There's no me and mine. Like I think there is. Of course there's a redder. That's why there isn't a redder like I thought there was. And this is the ping-ponging that he's doing, right? The pong, pong, that's what we decided last week. Yeah, the, um, um, the idea of self, meaning I exist. Not like you think you do, prove it. You don't look anything like you did six years ago. How can you say that's you? That, that solid me, 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 not happening, does not exist like we think it does. There is no person, there's no self, there's, in that sense. But am I talking? Duh, yeah. An unexamined reality exists. But when you go examining it, it gets a little trippy when you go digging. So that last paragraph is like, there can never be a stream enterer that is a self, that is, uh, has stuff, parts, or that exists over a life. All that exists over time, lifetimes. There's no such thing. That's why there is one. Because there isn't one out there. There is one projected, forced upon you by movement of your mind, karmas. Because things don't have a nature. If they had a nature, you would always be like you were born. Like they, you would never change. Pop out of your mum, and then you, that would be you forever. 
frozen, unchangeable. The fact that you change means you're not that. Because now you're not that. So where is that you? It's a conception that follows you around. That one exists. This dependent arising that's forever shifting, that exists. But that's not the one that was here yesterday. But there's no you. You carry the same name, but your name has all these different associations. So that's what they're getting to. What the hell is a stream enterer? Does anyone know? Some of you know. We're going to get to know about it. What do you think, if you haven't heard it before? I come across it a few times. Isn't that like levels that, like the, that's first level towards enlightenment? Is yeah. That like jhanas? Is that good, good. Okay. So imagine, we'll talk about it in detail. There are basically two types of being in all, beings in all of existence. Remember the last class there were billions and billions of planets, inhabited planets with countless beings in all of them. Yeah through the six realms, like too many beings, yeah. You can divide all those infinite number of beings into two types. They're all, their mind streams are all infinite, no beginning, no end. That's another story, tangent, you go figure it out. Yeah, we'll come to one of those 10 week classes, tangent. Recognize that, that we, it's not just these people in New York City, because that's all we can see, okay? New York is filled with more people than the ones in this room. You're good with that? Good. And therefore, there are more people in the United States. And therefore, there is more people in the planet. And it's not just people. There are other beings that have existences, that have minds. And if that's true here, then it's true for the entire universe. Billions of creatures. And so, time without beginning, this consciousness has been coming and going into experiences. And you can divide all of those minds that are having, that are beings, that are beings and things, into, into two types. Um, and, and a stream enterer sort of draws the line where you flip. It's like before you lost your virginity and after you lost your virginity. Very different thinking about what sex is. Yeah, you have a really nice, whatever fabrication or bad fabrication of what sex might be. And when you have it, you can't undo it. You can't like pretend, you can't go back to the previous. You can remember it, but you can't live in that state of being once you've broken that barrier. So it's similarly here. A stream enter is someone, someone who has entered the stream, in essence, means someone who has, something has happened to them. They are just on a conveyor belt to enlightenment. They can't go back. Yeah, they're in a stream, in a continuous stream to enlightenment. So yes, they've got some work left to do, but it's inevitable. It is, it must happen to them. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a sex metaphor just to be naughty. <laughs> it's that one day that you know you're going to do it. <laughs> Where you're... I, I don't know, like we can think about where, where that point is where you haven't quite done it, but it's, it's going to happen tonight. Like, <laughs> you buy the condoms. Yeah, or something. Because, I mean, we've bought the condoms plenty of times, but then sometimes it didn't happen. Like, it, it, this, this is inevitable. <laughs> it's a short thing. <laughs> Uh, so the first, uh, the first, if we divide all beings into these two types, one type is called a so so k wall. So so k wall. So say that after me. So so k wall. Yeah. Uh, Pratagnata in Sanskrit. That's Tibetan. So so k wall. And it sounds like what it is. It's just an ordinary, plain being. A little so so. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's us if we are what we seem to be. Okay, it's us here on this planet, a little so so. We come and go, we get happy, we get sad, we get happy, we get angry, we live and die, we get sick, we get healthy. And we've been doing this for time immemorial. And it's not just us, it's all the people 
in Afghanistan and all the creatures in the sea, all the animals in Europe and Africa and everywhere. Creatures, so so chaos, that are they don't they don't have a definite ticket out of that cycle of existence. Coming and going, assuming tangent, rebirths, infinite without beginning. Yeah. There's no, uh, there's no way you could know when that will end for them. Over and over. Through this thing that we do many times in this human life and over lifetimes. We get stuff, we lose stuff. We get stuff, we lose stuff. We get happy, we get sad. Don't get too happy, you'll get sad. Yeah. So, so it's okay. We're just a normal, everyday job. Um, and I'm going to say some things in this class that I try not to say in all the other classes so people come back to Three Jewels. <laughs> but today I'm just going to say them. <laughs> because they, they're not of my doing. They're just facts of our lives. And I hint at them. But rarely do we talk about them. And... And I think, especially for this class, it's important to know what's coming in your lives. And I can't help it. I didn't make those things that are coming to you. And they're brought to you by samsara. Yeah. Aging, if you're lucky. Sickness and death. It, it's coming. And pretending it's not ain't going to make it go away. And I really try not to. Because we're so obsessed with, oh, I'm depressed, so I better get over depression. Don't worry about getting over depression. You're dying quickly. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is a little bigger. <laughs> you know, like, seriously, we, we are, um, we're focused on a detail that isn't, that, that if we put as much energy into something else, that detail will disappear with the something else. And that's the only point of studying this. If it was anything else, then go get drunk. Like, go have a party. <laughs> yeah, if this is just another thing that came and went. And the, and the only reason I think it's worth dedicating a lifetime of study is because if you can connect to the ideas inside here that are active and real, the realizations we talked about last week. You can already see the potential that what is, is not. That's why there are. There, the tree that you think exists is not a tree like you think it is. That's why there is a tree. Something made the tree. There's not that there's no tree, but there is no tree like you think there is. And if that's true for that, that's true for pen, that's true for you as a person, that's true for human as a being, that's true for your mind. It's not the way it is. It doesn't have to be this way, really. And can you surgically go in there and figure it out with logic and reasoning first? And then you need to do the work to get to the visceral experience. And this class is about that. Because when that unlocks... It's a different game. Using the sex metaphor, imagine none of you have ever had sex, right? Some of you are like, mm. some of you are like. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried this whole class to tell you about sex. You got to imagine the, this heat inside of you that gets like you get a little, mm, your eyes style. Like I can tell you all the story. You've never had it, okay? So you don't know what it's relating to. So I can tell you that blood pumps in places. <laughs> and things get sticky and you can't think right. And, you know, you're in this kind of headspace. I can tell you all those things. You're all smiling because you know what I'm talking about. If you've had good sex. Actually, no, even if you've had bad sex, you know what that's like. Um, actually, that's probably why you've had because <laughs> this is kind of getting lost in the moment. But anyway, back to the metaphor. I can tell someone that's never had that experience all about that experience. But imagine not having had it. Imagine just going by those instructions. 
try and get the heat. <laughs> try and get the, you know, like, it's like, oh, I have to do the heat thing and I have to <laughs> do the eye dilating thing. And, <laughs> and I have to get sweaty, you know. So, so you get the instruction for having sex, but you've never had it. And so you do weird shit with it, right? <laughs> And then once you've had it, you understand all those words in a very different way. Yeah, so, 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 okay, well, is someone getting the, is not having had it, okay? It's just a person stuck in trying to have the experience without knowing what it relates to. And so that's um, someone who has not seen emptiness directly. We've talked a lot about emptiness, the fact that things don't have a nature, that they are empty of being what they appear. It's one thing to intellectually know that. But imagine knowing <coughs> that. Your behavior would shift correctly, not trying to, you know, do whatever you think you need to do as a practitioner to get that thing. You'll be, if you knew it, like let me tell you about the taste of chocolate ice cream. You've never had it. And I start to describe it. There's a sweetness. There's a coolness. It's melty. <laughs> you know, like whatever words I try and tell you aren't the thing you're going to have when you put your lips onto that. Very different. And so you can divide all beings into those who have not had this direct experience of what all these concepts are talking about and pointing to. And assuming you are who you seem to be, then wear that in this room. Or if some of you, like Aaron, who popped in here, saying there's something very interesting happening here tonight, I would like to know about it. My name is Aaron. Um, a realized being, a being who has had that direct experience is called an Arya, like Aaron. Um, and, of course, some people in our world misappropriated that word. <laughs> it means superior being, but not like the Germans wanted it to mean. Um, so an Arya, or Pakpa in Tibetan, denotes a stream enterer, someone who, under certain conditions, has had a direct visceral experience with that thing we're trying to understand intellectually. Yeah? They've had emptiness sex. Yeah, they've not gone with the sex book only to trying to understand, generate sweaty palms, generate heartbeat rising, heat in the tummy, you know, whatever you do for sex, whatever the instructions would be if there were just instructions and none of us have ever had it. So you can divide all beings in the universe into this tiny few who, has ha who have had this direct experience of how actually the universe exists, empty of a nature, and all of us projecting our stuff, and that tree does exist as our projection forced upon us by whatever's in our minds. The problem for us is we think there's a tree out there, and Arya knows, understands, because they've seen this directly, viscerally, they understand there could never be a tree like you think exists. There's uh, that, that only tree that exists is the one you're projecting against your will. That's true for your life, for your name, for your hair, for your every, everything without exception is of the same nature. Everything without exception. And if that's true and too many things to think about, let's worry about depression, yeah? Then understanding this technology, we could apply to the main overarching thing that is our suffering, misunderstanding, death, dying, aging. Because that's also empty of a nature. Something is projecting that existence, even though we seem to, it seems to be out there like the tree. It must be the same. An Arya, a Pakpa, has had a direct experience and knows what will cause that or what has caused that or what did cause that. We are reading the sex manual about it and, and not really understanding. So tonight's class is about understanding what that realization could be like 
And once you get it, you'd be in an unstoppable stream enter, in an unstoppable stream to removing all the things that are causing the problems in the first place. All of them. Because you see what the real cause of suffering is. Misunderstanding how the world operates, how the universe exists in your mind. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah? So this class starts off by saying, what is it that we must do? What mountains of intellectualizing we must do to try and generate enough inertia to actually go down the roller coaster of the unstoppable, the stream enter? Yeah? Because many of us are like, mm, enjoying it, enjoying it, enjoying it, and we're stuck in a loop. But we need some kind of inertia to get us out of that loop and enter the stream. That means we can't return. If you've got that as a concept, dedicate it to some person that is stuck in a loop and then watch it grow in your mind. Okay? If it could be the future you that's stuck in the loop. So, a stream enterer, you could say, once they've unlocked the, the understanding of how reality functions, and once they've seen this ultimate thing, you can determine how long they've got to be in samsara, how many courses they've still got left for producing birth, aging, and nominal suffering. But now they have real tools to remove all of it. Yeah? Cause and effect never fail. You just now know what the real cause is for the real effects that you're having and not thinking over here. Once you have had the direct perception of emptiness, once you... Once you've tasted the ice cream or had the experience, you can't undo it, right? Um, you become, for those of you interested, you become what part, part of what Buddhists go for refuge to. You become two of the three jewels. So for those of you who have studied this before, what are the three jewels? Are they out there? Buddha. 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 Jewel. <laughs> Buddha's a thing. But a jewel is a different thing. Dharma jewel and Sangha jewel. Give me what they sort of really mean. What's a Buddha jewel? What's the jewel of the Buddha? Good. So ultimately, it's the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. A mind, like yours, or like a Buddha, is empty of a nature. It doesn't have to be that way or that way. They're lucky. They've produced the courses that will never stop to see themselves projected as the most blissful, awesome, all-encompassing creature. They've created those courses. Me, I've got shitty courses. Sometimes I'm a happy, sometimes I'm a not a happy. Sometimes I'm alive, sometimes I'm a dead. Yeah? So my mind has the projection, not by choice, by inertia, of whatever my life is. A so so kewo, let's say. Buddha has a projection, not called karma technicality, because they've got a kind of virtue, energy, uh, thing that produce, oh, the same projection. Going, this is a pretty awesome thing. I can see everything. Time doesn't exist for me. I see beyond thing. It's possible because the mind doesn't have a nature of being this way or that way. The mind is empty. So the Buddha jewel is... The emptiness of the Buddha mind. And that's what people say is your Buddha nature, for example. Meaning that part of you that will still be that part of you, your emptiness, the emptiness of your mind. The fact your mind does not have to be that way. It will be whatever the hell your mind projects onto itself. <laughs> Make sense? That's your Buddha nature. That's the Buddha jewel. You're not one of those once you've had the direct perception of emptiness. That's not what you are. <laughs> so not that one. What's the next one? Dharma jewel. We talked about dharma, which has so many meanings, right? What's a dharma? What's a dharma? A Buddhist teaching, like this Buddha dharma is a teaching. What else? Understanding. We can say an ultimate understanding. Another, a door is to hold up, right? Um, it's, a, it's a thing. You could, and this is a dharma, that's a dharma, that's a dharma. Everything is a dharma, it's a thing. 
But the biggest, most ultimate thing that is above all things is emptiness itself. That's a dharma because everything has it. So it's like the biggest all-encompassing dharma. Yeah? So in that respect, dharma is the knowing of emptiness. The not, that realization. Knowing that having had sex or having tasted the ice cream is very different than reading about the ice cream or reading about the sex. The dharma of emptiness, the knowing, is very different than reading. Yeah? So once you've had the direct perception, your mind has touched that thing, you can't undo it. That's one of the things you have inside of you. You know now emptiness is a truth. You, you've seen it. You've had a visceral, direct taste of ice cream. Or you've used the condoms or not. I don't like the condom analogy because it's sort of, you know, this protection. It should be no, no condoms. <laughs> yeah, it should be complete contact. I know it's not safe, but... <laughs> We, we got that? So you have that if, you've, if you're a Arya. If you've had a direct perception of emptiness, you're one of the very few creatures that now has an end date in suffering world. Everyone else, unknown end date. You now have an end date. You, because, and you can't undo that knowing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're now one of the refuges. All Buddhists around the world pray to the three jewels. Those that understand what they're praying to for protection are now praying to your realization. I, I want that. It will free me. It will give me an end date. Expiration date on samsara. And then the last one is the sangha jewel. The real deepest meaning of sangha is those beings that are no longer so-so, kewos, but are instead patpas, arias. Why are they real protection? Why would they be real protection? Those that have had a direct experience of emptiness. They give you the right Correct. They have the realization. So you want that. That's real protection. If you had it, who can teach you how to get there? Those that know all the words in the books but don't know what it feels like or those that know all the words in the books and know what it feels like? Which one is going to get you to ice cream quicker? The one that knows what ice cream reads like or the one that knows what ice cream looks like? They can get you to the ice cream shop way quicker. Right? Lucky I didn't use the sex metaphor for that one. Yeah? <laughs> so, yeah, the stream enterer has those two. You... You, you're all of a sudden two of the three refuges, two of the things that actually give you protection. Now, we got that as a basis. Any concerns? Any tiredness? Mm -hmm. Will you know if you perceive emptiness? Yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah. But you know, it's a really interesting question. Have... I'm just going to plant this seed because you asked it. Okay. Have you ever revisited a memory that many years later was not what you thought it was? And in that moment, your mind recoded your memory. Up until a minute before, you thought that memory was one thing. And then something in your mind forced your understanding of that memory to validly be something else. And all of a sudden, everything made sense. I know for me, that was like words from my dad after he died. He had said things to me when I was younger that made no sense. Later on, after he died, he appeared in meditation. and The meaning of those things had a completely different thing. I'm like, wow. So what was it? <laughs> that or this? So I'm just going to leave that there as a little tease. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so. Mm. Mm? <laughs> back of the book. Put it in the back of the book. 
<laughs> okay, back of the book, back of the book, back of the book. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about how to enter. What must we do to actually see emptiness directly? What are the things that we must do? And you've covered this already, but now it will have much deeper meaning. In the Tibetan tradition, it comes from the authentic, original Indian tradition. And we've con- that, that's the amazing thing about Tibetan Buddhists, that somehow it escaped too much manipulation and cultural uh, tweaking. When the Buddha taught, this is the closest to the original teachings of the Buddha. They got frozen up in Tibet for a thousand years. Their whole culture became about the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings. They created language to try and explain the books and translate the Sanskrit to Tibetan. Everything was about that. So, And then for a thousand years, nobody bothered them. And the British went and did stuff. So... We have Lam Rim, which is a, a, a summarized version of every step on the path to enlightenment. And there's so many texts on Lam Rim, steps to the, of the path to enlightenment. It's graduated. You do this, then you can do this. You do that, then you do that, then you do that. And it's so clear and linear that if you do the steps, you get the results. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Lam Rim. And so there's uh, to some Gom which is you learn it, you contemplate, you meditate on it, and then you do something, practice, and then you you can get the result. And it's the same for seeing emptiness directly. Um, And you've seen this slide in this course, I think, right? I think it was the second class or the first class, the five parts, which is really four. Why is it four? Because the last one doesn't exist at all. (laughs) Good, 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 good. The last one is not a path, it's a result. Yeah. I love it because if you just say that, somehow it makes it like, it's like, oh, it doesn't exist at all. Yeah. Wise. Yeah. (laughs) So remember this, we enter life and we think life is about fixing this little thing, getting the career, getting that. I'm going to say those things that I think need to be said. The life we're chasing ain't going to do it. You didn't do it for the previous generation or the parents that you have or the generation a hundred years before or the creatures that lived here a thousand years before that. The life we think we're living is going to give you the same result that it gave all those people. Okay. Doing what you think you're doing to get you some kind of ultimate happiness ain't going to do it. Sorry. Sorry. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do what you're doing, which is where our minds go, oh, fuck, let me screw it. So intercourse it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More polite. It's not that at all. You still got to do stuff with this body because everything has a consequence. Not doing something also has consequences. So it's not that we shouldn't do anything at all. But now if we understand that there is a chance, that there's a possibility that if you move from Soso Kewa to Pakpa, you could rewrite the entire game, then you get to choose how you do and what you do. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to cover in these parts. And these parts said, first, you need to understand that whatever you were doing ain't going to do it for you. And that's entering the first path, which is the path of accumulation which is having renunciation yeah so here are, I'm going to give you the three plus prerequisites to having um, to entering this stream and then um, we're going to detail about each but first of all you need renunciation you need to say I'm, I'm done that I've, I've had enough taste of broken ice cream to know I don't want that anymore. I've had enough relationships to know how they end up. So my engagement with relationships changes. It doesn't mean don't stop having relationships. I've had enough change of jobs to know that a job ain't doing it. I've had enough diets (laughs) to take care of this body to know it's going to break anyway. So the way I obsess about my mind and my body in this world and how much I take care of it, that ain't going to do it. Everyone else has tried doing that. The right face cream, 
And Cleopatra was bathing in some milk or something, right? She dead. <laughs> so you get a kind of I'm done, really like I'm done, and I get focused on what should I do. Sort of like Sabudi asked the Buddha, it's like, okay, if we all want to get to where you are, dude, what should we do? How should we think? Yeah. So the first thing is you want to get. We'll, we'll look at renunciation and the meanings and so on. But first thing you got to. Do, otherwise, you can't sustain the effort in what else you're going to do. You got to be done. You got to see the uh, what is it? See the writing on the wall. Yeah. Uh, if if you've been studying at Three Jewels, you know uh, you might know Lama Marut, amazing, incredible creature. Um, Sanskrit scholar, Tibetan scholar, great community, author, funny dude, like really funny. Big beard, bigger than mine. We used to compete, yeah? He passed away on, on Saturday. Yeah, now he, he did it in an incredible way. He knows exactly what he's doing through that process. But he spent a lifetime preparing for that moment. And if we don't, that's coming and it'll be a shock. And if your mind is in shock while that moment happens, results are equal to the shock. Summary on death process. Yeah. If death is empty, when it comes, it can be anything. Don't have to be shock or the results of shock. If you know it's coming and you know how it's coming and you know what your mind will tend to do and you've worked a lifetime to change it, then when that moment comes, it's like the door just got wide open for you not to be dead. Story. Tangent. But if you're not ready, it's the writings on the wall. Out of the, all the things, your certain's coming your way. That's definite. Not pretend. You might get a great boyfriend. You might get a great job. You might not. You might get fired. You might not. You might get heat. You might not. <laughs> but that one, writing's on the wall. It's coming. So out of all the things you're going to prepare, I'm going to worry about depression. You know, I'm going to worry about face cream. I'm going to worry about the job career. Everything you'll ever build in that way ain't you're not taking, ain't staying with you. So renunciation is this reality check going, whoa, I got no time at all. Who knows when they're dying? Anyone? Anyone got the date? Hour? Month? Year? Come on. Good. Decade? Anyone know which decade they're dying? I'm giving you lots of room. We don't. But you know it's coming. Pretending it doesn't. <laughs> so the younger you are, you have such power in a young mind, the more you can use that thing to really transform this human life into not so-so, okay, well, but Ar Aaron, Aria. <laughs> if possible, if, if possible, I'm selling you a story from Lord Buddha and before 2,500 years of pandits, monks and nuns turning this technology into something extraordinary. Yeah. And then condensed in here. It all has to do with having this visceral experience. And this is just the first hump. This is not even the game. This is getting ready for the game. This is conducive conditions for seeing emptiness directly is you better have renounced, had, had that kind of, I'm done with that way of living. I'm not saying done with living, done with that way of engaging with life. Does that make sense? Have I made you happy already? Good. Then you've got to get focused and study on what reality actually is. And we don't have a, enough time in one lifetime to figure out what's the right question. If we did, I'd say go experiment. But when death comes, if you're not ready, reset gets pressed. 
And then who remembers anything at birth? You know you have propensities, but you don't know where they came from. Some bastard put them there before you. Can I ask the question now? You can if it's, and I choose not I to answer right. it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So last week I did a past life regression. Mm -hmm. Never did it. And the way I died was that I got run through by a sword because mm -hmm. I was not aware and I was unprepared. And so what that insight tells me is that like oh i don't want the metaphorical same thing to happen to me in this life the same way mm -hmm. but if i feel similarly unaware and clueless what am i supposed to do like i'm aware that i'm clueless but that's we'll, like we'll get to that step. because what i can say is similar to mark right mark? yeah similar to mark's answer i don't know what past life regression you do does it work like a tree? Is there really past life regression? What would this say? No. Or just like what how, how, does, how does it come? How does it come? Your mind projecting onto a series of events a meaning called the sword went through my yeah. Okay, and in that sense, there is a dependent arising, but there is no. Right. There is no past life so like way that. To put it is right. Exactly. That like. During that experience, my mind brought up something. A that bunch said of things. Yeah. This. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, get, we'll get to giving you the tools. The problem's bigger than that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you've got to figure out what is it that, that is this thing called reality and where should I be looking? Because you have a finite time and you don't know the end date. There's only so much you can do with this body and this mind in this time. That's the real time you have, real little r, real. Yeah, that's the time you have in this body, in this mind. How long? Don't know. Is it more than now? It is now. <laughs> it is now. So in that finite time that you don't know, out of all the things you could do, <coughs> should you buy more shoes? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, it's just for you. <laughs> it's just for you. So <laughs> you're like, yes, I should. <laughs> Depends on your intention when buying the shoes. I just saved you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then study reality. Course seven effect <laughs> and effect. <laughs> Sorry, it's the ambassad didn't work. In the deepest way. And to cut to the chase. Buddha says it's all about understanding emptiness and dependent origination or mental imaging. The highest view of dependent origination, which is projections of your mind onto reality, idealizations. He says, if you don't know how long you've got, out of all the possible things you're going to go searching for reality, is it in how many heartbeats happen? Is it how many animals under rock? Is it what's the distance between here and the sun? Is it how many hairs in an elephant's back? Like out of all the possible knowledges that you could invest a lifetime with, Buddha says, better understand ultimate reality, the idea of emptiness. Things don't have a nature. And what your mind does to experience that nature, mental imaging or idealization. This subject called Chi Jedra, which I'll cover, which we're only going to taste. He says, you, you want to go looking at that if, you, if you've got renunciation. Yeah. Uh, and then you want to get your mind. So if you're in the meditation teacher training, you're at least working on one of these things. <laughs> You better get your mind to shamatha. You better get your mind so still in single-pointed concentration that when you see something close to an ultimate reality or the causes of suffering or the meaning behind, you can keep your mind there because you've trained the bastard not to go, oh, look at shoes. Sorry. Again. <laughs> yeah? He's getting so hard, sorry. <laughs> Because that's what our minds do uh, uh, without training. Yeah, monkey mind is, oh, look over here. Have you thought of this? That's why meditation is a thing. 
And most of the meditations we do nowadays are not meditations. They're just relax the body. Oh, good. It's going to die. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Serious. Don't be traumatized. Okay. You'll get traumatized after. <laughs> And if you understand past lives, when the reset button hits, sorry, screwed again. <gasps> fix the body. 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 So, at least these three are what we need to get enough inertia. Let's do it that way. These three to get enough inertia to get away from the gr uh, gravitational pull of samsara, suffering life. Without this kind of inertia, we can't get out of the orbit of seeing things as self-existent, as if they really exist. And that's what's the cause of our suffering in the first place, thinking things exist like we're perceiving them. And then if you don't agree with me, then you're wrong, then I punch you, and then I'm just creating more causes for me having problems. And I thought I was fixing problems. We're caught in quicksand in the way our minds naturally look at things. So Buddha says, if you want to get out of that orbit, renunciation, realize that the orbiting is a problem. Get done with it. Get committed. Try and investigate how the hell am I stuck in this orbit? What's really causing it? He says, it's the fact of emptiness, the way things really exist, and the way my mind connects with reality, how it labels it. It's not anything else. That's the, what is it, panacea? Is that, Yeah. And then you better have trained your mind like a horse to get it to do triage. Is that what they do? Yeah. No, how do horses do triage? Yeah. yeah, when they do exactly what you, yeah. Tame your bloody horse. And then if you want to go, is it triage or not? No. Dressage. What's triage? Huh? Yeah, don't do triage. Dressage. And then you can buy shoes. If you're a dressage. Yeah, anyway. And here is another shortcut. In order to generate a sweet inertia to get out of orbit, you better be, practice, be practicing kindness, taking care of as many beings mentally or physically as you possibly can because every interaction is an opportunity for you to create more fuel to get out of orbit. And kindness is the fuel. Taking care of others, even if you can't, imagine that you can, is it. And then if you've met, so if everything is a projection, and if you've met a teacher, a heart teacher, a special creature that turns that on for you, the, the search for meaning, the search for reality, the understanding of reality, if you, even if they are got a wart or they're ugly or they swear or whatever, Stick close to them like Velcro because you're just projected someone who's just giving you a key to reality. So Buddha says, besides the three orbits, try and infuse it with kindness. And if anyone or any set of beings are giving you insights into emptiness and dependence, stick to them like Velcro because they're also your projection. And since we're stuck in the orbit, our projections are going to have awesomeness and shittiness. <laughs> Life and death. Good and bad. All the time. Recognizing that's your projection gets you to take ownership because you've got <laughs> renunciation. You're not, your monkey mind isn't lost in reacting to a world like it used to. I hope you got the taste of that. Let's talk a little bit about renunciation. There might be an question on the homework question two that um, renunciation there's a couple of words that are synonyms I'll go fast here but they talk about leaving the worldly life what does that mean do you think leave the worldly life what do you think that would mean so divorce yourself from material goods yeah so should we not have anything at all redefine our relationship with those things Mm -hmm. Good, good. Because here is what the the synonyms for that is. Uh, Nel Jung means definitely come out, meaning come out of samsara. You got out of orbit. That's another synonym for renunciation. And then Rab Jung, 
is what monks do when they take on the robes. They renounce their home life. They leave their home, right? But it means, means mentally, right? And you, you said it just beautifully. Redefine your relationship to things. If you do, then you can all of a sudden use shoes or things to take care of others, to create more fuel to get out of orbit. If you've got, if shoes are in your life, may as well use them for good. It, there's no use in burning the shoes, yeah? Unless you are just reading the book on virginity rather than knowing it. Make sense? So am I talking too many metaphors? Okay, the role of renunciation is you need it. You need that kind of fuel or energy because we don't have time otherwise. If you're invested, your most productive work years are going to be somewhere between 28 and 39. I just made those numbers up, but it's somewhere in there. That's where you're strong enough to get shit done. That's where you're motivated enough to get up every morning and not be tired. That's when your bones are still functioning. That's where your heart hasn't been broken enough times that you take risks to get another heartbreak and another one. And then something happens around 40. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying generally, generally speaking. Yeah, generally speaking. The, the life energy of a being in this reality, which exists just not the way we think it exists, dies out. You, you have a bunch of energy at some peak period of your life, which I just define, you're right, for speaking for myself. But there will come a time, there'll, be, there'll come a time where you can't get your body out of the bed and then you'll, end, you'll be in the bed. There'll be a time where you can't walk up the stairs so you go to Florida and buy a stupid place that's one level. They'll, seriously, there'll be a time you can't eat the fatty fro the fried foods that you like so much because your tummy won't take it. That's what you're projecting. So the most, and there's a time where your mind is bright and engaged and fixing solutions and then you've made Uber. Great. <laughs> and then you're dead. But you made Uber. Great. <laughs> then you're dead. So... Because there's not much time and there's not that peak of capacity and ability is also an exhaustible thing. Renunciation serves the role of redirecting all that energy to the things that you must understand. Those three things I just mentioned. Get renunciation, understand reality, specific chi chedra, yeah? and um, get your mind settled get get your mind so serviceable that you when encountering ultimate you're stuck to it you're like i'm keeping my mind on it won't get away because a monkey mind will see it get away mm -hmm. so what happens that's called the path of accumulation <laughs> yeah R meaning you enter that when you're night and day you're like i'm done with the old way of living and i what did you say i Redefine. Redefine the way I engage with my world. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah? That's perfect. Because you, you're not disappearing and going into a cave. That's a practice, no problem. But at some point, you're going to have to come back and engage with all the crap that you were running away from. And if your mind isn't pliable, if your mindset isn't right, you're going to make more mistakes, even though you were in a cave for a long time. Yeah? So that that's... You make a decision. I'm, I want to figure it out. I'm done with the old way of thinking. Generations have screwed it up. I don't want to do it. I, I make the choice. Even if I can't get to the end, I'm going to generate the courses for getting this when the reset button happens. It'll be in my mind somewhere. Yeah, even if I can't reach the, the enough orbits this life, there's enough fuel for the next one to get me out of orbit or close to it. Then the next path is the path of, so you go accumulating fuel, then the next orbit is? Path of preparation. Path of preparation. You're preparing yourself for something, yeah? And this is all about the intellectual understanding of emptiness, really understanding those two things the Buddha said. 
How does reality really exist? What does emptiness actually mean? Things don't have a nature like I think they do. My mind is experiencing them. They are empty of being that. Whatever my mind is experiencing, karma, dependent origination, comes from somewhere in me. And I understand it, but where in me? Who put it there? What the hell is it? And that's the only way I can experience something because it doesn't have a nature. If it did have a nature, if this was this, then every creature that looked upon it must see it as this. And it would not change. It would always be this. It has never not been this. It's stuck in this. And that's not what it is. It's a changing thing. How is it changing? Ultimately, the minds that are perceiving it are labeling and dumping on it unwillingly a reality that is not in there. The reality is in here. So investigate those two things. And the study of Chijedra is the highest, most meaningful thing you can do with your mind to investigate and understand that. And Kedrup J says, I can't read it because it's up blind, but it's a good quote from Kedrup J. He was a contemporary of the first Dalai Lama. J. Tsongkhapa was his teacher in the 1500s and, and Kedrup J and the first Dalai Lama sort of lived at the same time, studied from the same dude. What's it say? Anyone who wants to see emptiness but does not want to study Chi Jedrak is like a hungry person who says they don't like food. <laughs> like a hungry person who doesn't. And th there's other metaphors that he uses, like you want to build a skyscraper with bubbles or something, you know, like <laughs> something like that. Anyway, um, so I'll give you quickly, because we don't, we have 20 minutes, we're never going to finish. Here we go. Let's see what your minds do. Chi is a, uh, what we call a general or a quality, a chi is a quality or something, or a general grouping. Mm -hmm. And a jedrak is a, a specific part of that general or, a or something characteristic of that quality. So you can have car, and then you can have a car. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You can have... Cars as a chi, and then Fords, Chevrolets, Lexus, and what's the electric one? Le Tesla. Teslas. They're all cars. They're all jedraks of that chi. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's important. And the thing that is most important here is to note the difference between car and a car. Car and the car and then apply it to person and the person or a person person and if you understand those groupings we're going to go a little deeper does that do you understand chi you all understand chi jed right now good <laughs> yes. I, I want to say one is an archetype and then something, so, what's, what's that? A glass. A glass, right? A glass. And if there was another one that looked different, what's that? A cup, damn it. A mug. <laughs> A mug. There's another glass, yeah. So these two are? A glass. This is the glass. That's a glass. Glasses. These are glasses. They're jedraks of glass. Where the hell is glass? Yeah? How is it that we can identify this as glass or a glass or the glass? Where in your mind does the idealization of glass come from who put it there for you to dump it on this thing? Because you know it upon looking at it. Instantly you know it. Where did it come from? If it came from here, everything must think glass. So it's not in here, but there's also a difference between that and this and the mother concept, glass. And when you go searching or investigating, when you go investigating that difference, your mind does something extraordinary. You'll get, when you meditate on glass or a glass, car or the car or a car, person or a person. 
let's go car. Walk down Fifth Avenue and a taxi's coming at you. Something in your mind is like, shit, the car. Remove the shit, leave the car. And when you, something in your mind instantly told you car is there. It didn't say elephant. It didn't say banana. It said car. What was it about that, that your mind knew to say car? And when, when you get to the mother car, not that car, not a car or the car, and you see how your mind is connecting those two, you then have the key to the next orbit. First orbit is renunciation. The next orbit is a deep understanding of emptiness and mental idealizations. Cheese and Jedrux. Yeah. There's something in there that can get you so much that if you've built meditation, you're out. Yeah. That's what the idea is. Um, so what is it that, uh, I, that makes us identify something as car or tree or candle or whatever? We see an object and instantly we know. Getting to think about and searching for what is it that's making that happen. And we're talking about physical objects, but it's true with love and it's true with hate and it's true with anger and it's true with um, all sorts of emotions. They're objects of the mind as well. Okay, so it's not just physical objects. It's like a sensation arises and your mind instantly has a chi and a jedrak in relation to that thing. And you better go find out where the hell it came from. What is it? Who put it there? Because if you're operating at that level, you're at the code of the matrix. Yeah? Cool. So I've got to tell you this really quickly. And we had a question, but can you just say the last sentence one more sentence? You'll get to the code of the metrics if you understand how chi and jedra operate in your mind. Objects are objects in your world. And I don't mean just physical objects, any object. Anything that your mind conceives of is connected to a chi and a jedra. It's actually a coding for all of existence. Yeah, this chi and jedra. And who the hell put it there? Why did you get car and some puppy dog didn't get car? Why did you get pen and someone got chew toy it's not in the object it's in your mind and now we're getting to the mind and who the hell put that there and why did that specific thing come out and if i understand the connection between the mother concept the archetype pen car cup whatever and the cup a cup those instances there's something in there that you you will see in your mind that will help you get to be an aria, get to be a stream enter, get to see emptiness directly. We're not even there yet. This is the hurdle of the second orbit. <laughs> Sorry. You'll know what seeds to plant. Exactly. You'll know exactly which seeds to plant to perceive yourself as getting out of orbit. Really cool. Because until then, you're just living with seeds that you think exist out there, separate to you. When you see the code of the, you can start rewriting code. Yeah, sorry to mix up things. So uh, there's four types of cheese. Only three are important, but one is most important. And this is just to give you a taste of the depth and also to answer a question in your homework. The four types of cheese are rick cheese, dun cheese, dra cheese, and top cheese. Rick cheese, sorry, dun cheese and dra cheese are sort of subtypes of a rick cheese. Yeah, and a rick cheese is a type or a kind. Um, that individual things, Jedrax, are characteristic of that. And I just gave you car as the archetype. And many things fit under car. The car, a Chevy, a... What was it? Tesla. A Tesla. Not all tes Not... All Teslas are cars, but not all cars are Teslas. And that, that relationship is important. So how do we know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a dunchi is a mental image of something you have already experienced directly. So you probably all have a dunchi of the taste of ice cream. Yeah, you probably have a mental imprint of the taste of... When I say taste of ice cream, your mind did something, a dunchi popped up, and you know exactly what it tastes like because you've tasted ice cream. But if... 
But if I told you that in the in northern Queensland, in the north of Australia, there is an ice cream rainforest ice cream company that makes rainforest fruit ice cream, and I'm trying to think of the name of the fruit. Let's say blah blah fruit. I can't remember the name of it, but it, uh, it's Chipotle. Chipotle. Have you had that Chipotle fruit? It's like it's like chocolate mousse. It's weird fruit. I know it sounds like Chipotle. It is Chipotle, but it's not that Chipotle. <laughs> yeah, Ch- Chipotle fruit, and it's pitch black. It's sticky, and it's it's fluffy like mousse. But it's not that sweet, and they make ice cream out of that. You can't have a dunchi of that because you have not had a direct experience of that taste. But your mind has a drachi, yeah, a mental idealization of what that might be like. Why? Because I told you it's a fruit with certain qualities. You know what fruits are. You know what ice cream is, and your mind just went. Mm. It grabbed those cheese together, created a new. Chi that, that you haven't experienced. But it's still there, isn't it? Yeah. So your mind just did those two. Either ice cream because you've had it or ice cream you haven't had. It created a mental idealization of something. A, a rich chi is like the main grouping of those two things. When we experience something, ice cream, you're never really experiencing ice cream. You're always experiencing your dunchi of ice cream your mind is having a experience and that label this tastes like what ice cream should taste like is what we think the thing is we're holding we get stuck in the mental idealization that occurred and we mistake that for the thing we're holding does that make sense when we look at the car, our mind went car, and we are only ever seeing our mental image of a car. We're never really seeing the reality that is outside our mind. Do you see that? When you get to understand that, like Sarah said, you can then begin to operate at the level of your, the seeds you're planting. What the hell produced that kind of car? What the hell produced that kind of ice cream? And if you understand the things that you planted in your mind to produce that result, because you don't know why you had that result. If you can figure that out, then all of a sudden, death don't have to be death. Suffering don't have to be suffering. Orbiting don't have to be orbiting. Living being don't have to be living being if you're going to take it to the extreme. Just, who said that? Someone said that. Okay. Sokchi is just a, a, sometimes people describe emptiness with Sokchi. It's not, it's just a collection of physical parts. You know, I'm a Sokchi of my arms and legs and feet. It's just as, you should know that there are four divisions. There's a ton of study in here, okay? I'm just giving you a taste. You're still on the path of preparation. You're trying to understand reality through emptiness and how things arise, mental imaging. Yeah, and so this study is vital, figuring it out. And you can find it not just in Tibetan, but you can look at it in Western terms. How is it that the mind conceives of something? And in Western terms, you know your brain is sitting in pitch black skulls, and yet you're having a light experience of a person moving here with fluorescent lights above you and looking at a screen. You're not looking at a screen. You're looking at your mental image of a screen, and you're mistaking it for the screen. Because your brain and the electrical signals going on in there is pitch black. The same with the sounds I'm saying. You're not hearing what I'm saying. You're hearing what your mental idealization of the electrical signals that got to the brain through the eardrum are happening. But you're doing it in pitch black brains. And then Buddhists would go, not just that, you're adding a mental layer, the dunchis or the drachis over that. That's how reality actually exists. <laughs> and yet, this sort of functions, so we're operating here. Are you good there so far? Yeah. Okay, so understanding that that's something worth investigating is 
part of the path of preparation, sort of you're generating inertia. Another part of the path of preparation is this thing called highest dharma or chuchok, uh, truth of deceptive reality. You intellectually first, uh, under, you intellectually understand how your mind is constructing reality. Based on clues from the outside, your mind is creating, based on decibels from my mouth, your mind is creating meaning to sounds, sounds to words, to sentences and meaning, like that, so quickly. And so once you've studied enough, once you've created enough, accumulated enough virtue through renunciation, really trying to figure it all out, you're in the path of preparation and you're studying Chi Chedrak or whatever you need to study to get to see how my mind is fabricating my reality and you're close. And at some point, awake, not in meditation, you get to have a visceral experience on how it is that my mind just created a reality. And if you've seen my TED talk, it's something like that. Someone's yelling at me and after a bunch of study and a bunch of practice, I couldn't see the screaming boss. I saw this des, 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 not desperate, desperate. No, not desperate. I mean, he was desperate, but <laughs> disparate. Yeah, not desperate, disparate. <laughs> I saw part. I didn't see boss for a millisecond. Everything went black, pitch dark, sound wise. And I could see shapes. And on those shapes, my mind labeling Gary suffering, but like very slow motion. And you, I saw how my mind created that particular boss called Gary, who's an asshole. Yeah? For me. It's not out there. Out there is a bunch of data that my mind idealized and collected correctly so in that situation as this terrible experience. But there was no terrible experience out there. My mind fabricated and it was like the most incredible thing I have ever seen in all my years of existence. Having seen your mind generate a reality that you were sure was out there all the time. And for that millisecond, the asshole yelling at me showed me that it didn't have to be that way. That in fact, it was me projecting asshole against my will because nobody wants to do that. And I had fabricated the whole thing. My mind had dunchied or drachied that whole experience. All of a sudden, the power to start or stop assholes was here. Never more from that day was that power out there. And so they say you get this peak experience, this um, thing called chucho, the highest dharma. And it's in the final moments of Jorlam, the path of preparation, where you, you actually see what's called dependent origination. Upon shapes and colors, your mind idealizes and labels a reality. And you mistake it for the reality, except for a moment you see it, you see the gap. And at that point, you're close. You're close to having this, we're trying to be what? We're trying to be Arius, not so-so chaos, right? At that moment, you're close. You actually see how you're projecting deceptive realities that you got, that you were misinterpreting your dunchies all along. And all of a sudden, that shifts the game. It's no longer out there having to move the pieces or buy the shoes. It's in you. That's like at the edge of leaving orbit, at the very edge of leaving or orbit. Um, and they say it's highest dharma because it's the highest perception you can have as a so-so kewa, as a normal being. It isn't the highest dharma. The highest dharma is the Buddha dharma. The, an enlightened being having dharmas is the highest dharma. But they call it the highest dharma because for regular beings who are caught up in infinite suffering, that is the peak of understanding where the suffering comes from. And you can get there if you have a mind. And you can get there if you if you give up on the thing that's not going to work. 
re-engage your energy towards something that's actually going to help. Or you can just go with a mountain of other beings who become corpses week after week. And then it's, it's not enough to have that experience. You actually need to have trained your stupid minds to focus. You need shamatha. You need single-pointed concentration. Otherwise, you can't sustain that thing. So they say after that moment, you sit in meditation and you put your mind on what you just saw, this idealization upon things that don't have a nature, that the clues of shape and and thing called it yelling, upsetting, asshole boss. That that thing is empty of that and that upon that my mind, because of what it had in it, created that reality. And so then you, you, you got to understand that under the influence of those things, and I also said kindness and stick to a teacher, right? Renunciation, study Chi Chedrak, practice kindness. Then you can become a stream enter you enter into the path of seeing where you see emptiness directly no longer trying to understand intellectually but you are now having a visceral experience forced upon you by your past karma all the past virtue you've accumulated all the effort of trying to understand classroom hours meditation hours kindnesses to give wisdom to others all that generation is forcing you out of orbit of things that don't work. And then you have this experience called the direct perception of emptiness where you, they call it water poured into water because the, the appearance of being object, subject, looking at emptiness and perceive, perceiving emptiness and emptiness seem to merge. In that direct perception of emptiness, they, this thing called non-duality. It's indescribable. They say you cannot describe it. It's not something you can put words to because words are cheese. Yeah? Someone moved my cheese. Right, to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. So in the direct perception of emptiness, you have this experience of non-duality with sub, or of subject-object. Your mind and the thing it's looking at. Ultimate reality and your mind. And, and you have a perception that that does not exist. And I want to clarify a couple of things. It's the appearance of two things disappears. The appearance of object subject disappears. It's not that you become emptiness. It's not that. Your mind is in, in emptiness perception, but the perception that is labeling it, I'm watching something, disappears. You're in the ultimate you're in an ultimate experience. And in an ultimate experience, you can't have a relative experience. So you, so you can't say, finally, I've done it. I've got out of orbit. Because as soon as you say, I've done it, you're not in it. You're not in emptiness. You're in relative reality. You're in appearances. That's what the second verse was that Subhuti said to Buddha. You can't stay in eye, ear, nose, tongue, or things. You can't, as soon as you are, you'd be out. You wouldn't be a stream enterer if you were, right? So it, we'll get to it. So when we say non-duality, it doesn't mean that you merged with something. It means that the appearance of two things, subject, object, my mind and emptiness, the appearance disappears and it gives you the impression that it's like water poured into water. The other meaning of non-duality is that me and the thing I'm looking at are completely equal insofar as that we are both emptiness. We have, em I have emptiness and it has, in that respect, like the diamond, it's non-dual with every existing thing. We are non-dual. And so it's a chula chakpa. It doesn't mean that our object and subject are not there. It doesn't mean you don't exist. It doesn't mean that there aren't separate objects. They're all misunderstandings. It's someone who's never had sex trying to tell you how to have sex. If, if someone tells you you don't exist, and if they leave it at that and they don't explain how you do exist, then it's someone telling you how to have sex who's never had sex or selling you ice cream, trying to get you to an ice cream shop and they've never had ice cream. And so you're, at, I don't know, at a 
hardware store looking for ice cream. Yeah, metaphor, metaphor. Um, they tend to describe that. So we're still at um, the path of seeing. And on the back end, I'm going to go over five, seven minutes. It's 9.30 and I'd like to do it. Yeah. Even though I'm going to be very late for the next thing. At the end of the path of seeing, after you have this rising experience, your mind actually isn't even on this level of existence. You've settled your mind so much. They say it's in another realm, in the formless realm. And someone can punch you or, and you won't come out of meditation. You've trained your mind so well. And in that state, you see emptiness directly. You have this water poured into water experience that you can't describe. In that moment, you can't be aware of yourself having the experience, etc. Within a certain short amount of time, 15, 20 minutes, you begin to descend from that experience. You begin to come back to your meditation seat. This is in meditation. And they, they have this thing called subsequent wisdom, Jetob Yeshe, where your mind has a series of realizations, some on the cushion, some for up to 24 hours after, you've radically altered your mind. You've gone from Soso Kewa to Arya or Pakpa. Yeah? So the infinite, the infinity of your mind has just had a, a moment in it, which means you're out of suffering. You're on a conveyor belt out. You're a stream enterer. There is a, there is a definite time for you to exhaust all the causes of suffering that you've got inside of you because now you know the technology. So this series of realizations, I'm just going to put them up really quickly. They are summarized in the four Arya truths, mistranslated as four noble truths by early British translators. For Arya truths are the truths of a pakpa, the truths of a being who has seen emptiness directly of a stream enterer. And they are the truth of suffering, meaning you see directly death. You see why death is death. You see what causes things to stop. You know impermanence. You see that everything is that starts in a certain way must end. And that's a result of the causes of suffering. Something made that be. And you get to see that. And so there's all this, you see death, you see the mental afflictions of other people. Um, you realize you've never had a correct perception in your life. You realize that you've always been thinking things exist out there until that moment. And that's the cause of things ending. So all of a sudden, you, you now know how to rewrite the code. So you know suffering and the, your personal causes for experiencing suffering. Um, you also realize that you've never done a thing that wasn't somehow self-serving. Even the kindest, most beautiful thing, like I'm sitting here to do the nicest prayer for the sake of my mom not dying. Please, mom, not die. I'm partly aware that the doctor's watching me be very prayerful. It's not a pure, you realize you've never done a pure, pure thing like that. Uh, right. de depends on your motivation. What he's saying is, what, what the texts are saying is that up until this point, even the joyful effort has a selfishness to it, has a self-serving... Yeah. yeah, that's what they're saying. You will also have the understanding that uh, suffering can end. It can stop. It does not have to be an ongoing permanent thing. You meet what's called the Dharmakaya. They say you meet a Buddha, but you're actually seeing the emptiness of your mind, which is exactly the same as the emptiness of a Buddha's mind. And so you have like this direct communion. Your mind is now reconceiving recon what you just experienced and is labeling these sort of 12 things into 16 things into these four truths that are summarized as the four Arya truths. So then you realize suffering can end and you are certain of it. And then you also understand that this dharma, and, I, and it's not to say Buddhists win, is that this conception of the world, however the hell you call it, mental labeling, things don't have a nature, cause and effect never fail. 
my mind is continuous. That realization functions. You realize how you could pick up a Dharma book and get to freedom. You can see how this, the realizations in here are true. Everything the Buddha said was true because you now have a code to read it as true. And you can use it to get out. All of the Buddhist teachings are about this realization. Without it, they're just more things to do. They're more shoes. Yeah. Here is... So, so, sorry. So, Jetob Yeshe is the subsequent wisdom. Within 24 hours, you read people's minds. You, you get to see how people are trying to trick you. You have these extraordinary out-of-body experiences that collectively are the four Arya truths or the four noble truths. There is suffering. Shit, I caused it by misunderstanding how I go about my world. I punched him thinking I was going to be happy. That's just going to be more punching. Same for death. It can end because it's in here. It's not out there. And now I know exactly how to end it. I just saw it. Now you get to work. You've got to start traveling out of orbit. Now you get to work. But now you are certain to get out. And so there's also this term illusion. As you come down from that experience and the 20 something hours start passing, something horrible happens. The old way of the world exerting itself as if it existed out there re-exerts itself. You didn't get rid of it. You just saw how it worked. And so as you come to, things still begin to appear, continue to appear like they used to. You only get happy by getting things for you. You only get away from suffering by punching people that hurt you. That still appears as self-existent, even though you saw how things don't have self-existence. That lie, because you've been habituating it from time without beginning, that inertia is still here. It didn't go away just because you saw the mechanics of it. You now have to deal with your particular <laughs> bullshit that you planted from time without beginning. Congrats. The big difference is, and that's what the meaning illusion is, the big difference is you don't believe the bullshit anymore. Of course, the angry boss is yelling at me so I can yell at him. That's what's going to cause more angry bosses. I didn't know that yelling at him was making more angry bosses. So now, even though it appears like I must yell at him because he's being really unfair and I don't deserve this, there's no way I'm yelling at him because I know what it will produce. So I'm saying, oh, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Can I help you? You're the best person I've ever met. And mean it. Now he'll get angry. At, but that's another story, right? So um, things still begin to reassert themselves as existing. And, and you just don't believe that appearance. And that's the meaning of illusion. There's no other meaning of illusion. Things exist. There is an angry boss. But it appears different to what it actually is. It's my projection. Forced upon the sh shitty yelling I've done in the past. I don't want it anymore. So I'm not going to yell. All of a sudden, power is mine. Uh, uh, uh. So it's not that things don't exist. That's not what illusion means. It means they exist just like you made them. <laughs> but now you know it's a lie. A couple of things stop forever and then really I'm done. Uh, <laughs> your intellectual understanding of self-existence disappears. You know now intellectually that things um, don't exist the way they appear you, because of what you tasted ice cream. Yeah. And you no longer doubt this teaching or the path. You see how it actually functions. You saw it directly. And there's a name for, for that. Now, what happens? The, the name is Tong, uh, Tongpang or the two mental functions that disappear. Doubt, like I know I'm onto the right thing finally. And I see what things appear and not what they are. Those two are 100% yours from that moment on. And those two things, that's all you need to undo suffering forever, including old age and death. 
and everyone's suffering. And that's what enlightenment is. The working with that code to undo the thing that's broken. So then you enter the path of habituation, gom lam. You now have to get out of orbit. You know how to. You need to figure out how to put your thrusters on. You need to figure out when to press <coughs> turbo. You've got the fuel. It's all done. You've done the laps. You've got renunciation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You want to get out. So you need to start practicing what you saw directly. You need to habituate your mind, undo the causes of your own suffering by not yelling at the boss, by not being down on your depression. Depression is caused by some other depressing thing you've done towards others in the past. And when depression comes, you want to use it to remove everyone's depression. You can use it as fuel to get out. Very different technology. So you, get, you, you start getting used to removing one by one all the things that cause our suffering. Ultimately, you want to get rid of the seed that perceives things as self-existent. You want to get rid of the, that mistake and, and the subtlety of that mistake. Sorry. Uh, all those cheese in your mind, the seven billion plus of them, all these things you call beings, um, you realize they can shift too. And then you have this heartfelt, I, I really want to figure this out, not just for me, but for all the other creatures. I know it's a lot. I'm sorry. Okay, one more. Now let's see if you understand what that meant. Can you read it again? <laughs> and he respectfully replied, O conqueror, they do not. And why is it so? It is, O conqueror, because it would be impossible for them to enter anything at all. And this is precisely why we can even speak of a stream enterer. They neither enter into things that you can see, nor into words, nor into smells, nor into tastes, nor into things you can touch, nor into objects of the thought. And this, again, is precisely why we can even speak of them as having entered the stream. And if it happened, O conqueror, that a stream enterer were to think to themselves, I have attained the goal of entering the stream, then they would begin to grasp to some self in it. And they would begin to grasp to a living being and to something <coughs> that lives and to a person. So hopefully you got a little bit more. This is what you're going to look like if you do it properly. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the kind of visions that you're going to have. <laughs> Once you realize what your dunchis come from. Another realization you have uh, coming out of the direct experience of emptiness is the paintings of holy beings, the tankas of Buddhas and so on. You get a realization that they are referring to something someone actually saw, an actual being who has this mind. And some, the first person that saw it painted it, sketched it, saying, I saw this deity, this being, this part of my mind. You're like astronauts of your own mind and you get to see other beings in your universe, in a universe, and you draw them when you come back. And then maybe copy, paste, copy, paste, painters copy and paste the Buddhist paintings. But somebody saw those initial beings and you get that realization when you, um, when you come out of emptiness. Hopefully that gave you a taste. Here is the... Here is the assignment if you want to contemplate or meditate on it. The preliminaries, if you know what they are. If not, contemplate on general and specific or quality and characteristic of that quality in regards to whatever your meditation object is. But I suggest thinking, what's teacher? Or what's the teacher? Or what's a teacher of wisdom for you? Who's appeared in your life as teacher? Where did that come from? What seeds must you have to see teacher and on that let's do a quick very quick dedication and then we're running to journey <laughs> Sangye Shindu Mite Duwargi Dropun Namda Shinla Triparsho 
Idam Guru Radna Mandala Kam Niryaktayami Dhyagoku Sunam Yeshe Tsok Tsok Shin Sunam Yeshe Legend Way Dampakuni I'm deeply grateful to share it. The only thing that I believe is going to shift anything and thank you for your ears and your minds and your time. I hope you turn it into something however you can. Thank you, Hector. Mm-hmm.